Gaude amus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. Throughout our series, we've traveled from east to west and back again. We've shifted between Greek culture and Latin culture, with a brief detour in Syriac. In this episode, we'll meet a man who was truly ecumenical, who was born among Greeks but lived long among Latins. We'll meet a monk whose brilliant theological work was formed by Eastern and Western traditions, and who strove to bring Rome and Constantinople together in common cause for the Orthodox faith. His name was Maximus, and he is known to history as Maximus the Confessor. He was born around 580, and he died in 662. His origins are disputed. There are two biographies surviving from antiquity. One treats him warmly. The other is hostile to him. One says he was born and raised in Constantinople, the other that he was born and raised in Palestine. He was what we today call a polarizing figure, and so some political factions wanted to claim him, while others wanted to revile him. Assigning his birth to one city or another came with a variety of positive or negative associations. At this far remove, it's hard to say which version is history and which is propaganda. We do know that he received an excellent education in his youth, because that is evident in all his writings. He demonstrated a mastery of Plato and Aristotle, as well as the later Neoplatonists. He knew scripture and the history of commentary, and had a profound understanding of the earlier fathers, especially Gregory of Nazianzus and Dionysius the Areopagite. It seems likely that he pursued his studies at a major institution with an extensive library. Was it a monastery in Palestine? Or was it the university in Constantinople? Or was it both? We don't know for sure, but a plausible case can be made either way. Wherever he studied, he so excelled that he caught the attention of the imperial court, and at an early age Maximus was drawn into civil service. It was a difficult moment in the history of the Eastern Empire. The war with Persia had run hot and cold for 400 years. At the moment, it was running hot. The Emperor Heraclius fought fiercely and managed to recover lands that had been lost long before. He even retrieved the relics of the True Cross, which had been taken from Jerusalem as spoils of war. But new troubles were emerging to the east, with incursions from the scattered Arab tribes, who would eventually find unity under the warlord Muhammad. Maximus soon rose to serve Heraclius as chief of staff. There he had ample opportunities to hone his skills at negotiation, debate, diplomacy, and coalition building. It would all come in handy. But he was not long for life at court. After a few years, he gave notice and entered religious life as a monk. He spent the next eight years in monasteries close to the capital, and he maintained contact with aristocrats and courtiers. In fact, some of his earliest theological works he composed in response to questions posed by friends from his former life. The contemplative life was congenial to his literary development. From the start, Maximus was prolific, but never hurried. He had passion for precision, and he was fearless in his approach to troublesome passages in scripture and difficult statements of the earlier fathers. Monastic life was disrupted, however, when the Persians advanced toward the capital. Maximus and his companions fled to Crete, and then perhaps to Cyprus, before landing in North Africa in 628. There, near the city of Carthage, monks from all over the east were converging as refugees from various wars and skirmishes. Long a Roman province, North Africa was culturally Latin. After a brief period under barbarian rule, it was now under the control of the Byzantine Greeks. At Carthage, 
Maximus met a Palestinian monk named Sophronius, who served as abbot to the refugee community in Africa. Sophronius was profoundly troubled by the effects of war upon the church. Since the Council of Chalcedon in 451, Christians in Egypt and Syria had been deeply divided. Nestorians and Monophysites refused to accept the Council's doctrine about the person and natures of Jesus Christ. They built their own churches and lived in their own enclaves, and they maintained uneasy relations with the imperial capital. The emperor worried that such disunity made the empire weaker in the face of threats from Persians and Arabs. He pushed for a religious compromise, and he found many churchmen eager to work for it. They proposed several alternative theologies that fudged the difference between orthodoxy and heresy. The two most popular were monothelitism and monenergism. The first proposed that Jesus Christ had only one will, and that was the divine will. The second was related in its approach, insisting that Jesus had only one energy or activity, and it was divine. Sophronius worried that these accommodations were undermining the Church's traditional doctrine, which had been carefully defined at the councils of Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon. He saw them as nothing less than a betrayal of the Christian heritage. Long before his flight to Carthage, he had documented his case against monothelitism and monenergism. He had gathered abundant counterwitnesses from the Bible, the Fathers, and the Councils. Sophronius made his case and gained many allies in the North African church. His fellow monks rallied to his cause. Maximus was much impressed by the evidence, and he began to write passionate and persuasive, but characteristically precise treatises on the matter. He noted that the monothelite doctrine raised new and serious problems. How, for example, could Christians understand Jesus' agony in the garden, except as the struggle of human will to conform to God's will? If Christ had only one will, what was the struggle? The agony would be reduced to a sham. His arguments carried the day with the church in North Africa, but not in the capital city. In Constantinople, the elites were unmoved. With the Emperor Heraclius, they believed that religious unity would bring about political unity, and thus united, the empire would repel the Persians and Arabs. Monothelitism was, they believed, the only way to make this happen. And so they doubled down on the doctrine. Heraclius died and was succeeded first by his sons and then by his grandson, and monothelitism became the official religion of the empire. This did not sit well with the monks in Carthage, nor did it please the Pope in Rome. But Rome was intellectually degenerate at that time and had botched its correspondence with Constantinople. Confusion reigned, and as one recent historian put it, Chalcedon was dangerously close to extinction. The Church desperately needed an articulate advocate of Sophronius's impressive intellectual caliber and literary skills. The problem was that Sophronius had died in 638. Now there was only one man on earth who fit that job description. It was Maximus. In Carthage, Maximus continued to press his case. He engaged in public debate with a man named Pyrrhus, the deposed patriarch of Constantinople, who was perhaps the most prominent monothelite on the planet. The debate was attended by many African bishops, who agreed to serve as judges. But judgment was not necessary. Maximus triumphed in a clear rhetorical victory, and Pyrrhus publicly acknowledged the error of his ways. He recanted, and he and Maximus set sail for Rome to make a public profession of faith before the Pope. In Rome, Maximus made common cause with Pope Theodore I. The pontiff recognized the gravity of the situation, and both men recognized the need for a church council to bring about a settlement, as had happened at Nicaea and Constantinople and Ephesus and Chalcedon. So together, Maximus and Theodore began to make arrangements for a council to be held at the Lateran Basilica in Rome. This was a bold move. 
every previous council had been summoned not by the Pope, but by the Emperor. Maximus was well aware of this, but he argued that the imperial summons was inessential, and that the earlier emperors had proven their authority to be invalid by their later trafficking with heretics. Pope Theodore died and was succeeded by Martin I. The Lateran Synod went on as planned in 649, and it was intensively planned. The Pope had Maximus drop a tightly scripted agenda, and it's likely that Maximus drafted the official account of the Council's acts. In Constantinople, meanwhile, both the court and the Patriarchate were infuriated by what they saw as a usurpation and a treasonous act. It was, moreover, a public relations disaster, sharpening divisions throughout the empire and emboldening dissent from imperial policy. The emperor ordered the arrest of both Maximus and Pope Martin, and both were taken from Rome in chains in 653. Martin was banished without a trial. Maximus was offered a deal, but he refused to renounce his actions or accept monothelitism. So he was exiled to Thrace, where he continued to write and speak. He was brought back to Constantinople for a second trial in 658, but once again he refused to recant. Exiled again, he simply returned to his work. Tried a third time in 662, he was subjected to torture, but he persevered in confessing the faith of Chalcedon and condemning monothelitism as a heresy. For those offenses, his right hand was cut off and his tongue cut out, so that he could never write or speak against the emperor's wishes again. But he spoke through his endurance and his silence. Dying a few months later, he was immediately revered as a saint by ordinary people. They tagged him as the confessor, because he had confessed his faith publicly through an ordeal lasting many years. Soon the emperor saw that monothelitism could not unite the empire. The doctrine, in fact, had only introduced further division, driving a wedge between Eastern and Western Christians. He tried to patch up relations with Rome, but the damage had been done. The lands of the Eastern Empire were falling like dominoes before the Arabs led by Muhammad. Maximus had lived his life at the last moment when free travel was possible from Palestine to Africa to Rome. He lived at a moment when intellectual currents were merging as monks moved westward. He developed a capacious, truly ecumenical mind. I have focused almost entirely on his role in public events, but he is actually better known for his contributions to theological culture. Maximus was a pivotal feature in the history of theology. He trained his critical faculties on the great works of his forebears, and he interpreted them for future generations. He resolved their difficulties. He corrected their errors. He fashioned, moreover, a synthesis of their thought, a stunning, cosmic vision of the world in the process of its redemption. St. Paul, in his letters to the Ephesians and Colossians, had presented Christ as a redeemer not only of man, but of the universe. Maximus took this and ran with it. He presented creation and history as a cosmic liturgy in which human beings stand as priests who mediate salvation and present the world as an offering. Nature praises God, he said, with silent voices, while humanity gives voice to this universal worship. The life of the Christian he described as a process of gradual divinization. He said, through desire and intense love, the soul holds fast to God and participates in the divine life. The soul becomes godlike through divinization. The human body, even according to Maximus, gains familiarity with God in Christ by the steady practice of the virtues. The doctrine of deification had been present in the Fathers since the first generation. It was explicit in Irenaeus, Athanasius, Gregory of Nazianzus, and many others. But in Maximus, it became a dominant and pervasive theme, theologically developed and poetically expressed. In the 20th century, Hans Urs von Balthasar declared the work of Maximus to be the completion and full maturity of Greek mystical, theological, and philosophical thought. Yet in the West, he was neglected for centuries after his death. 
In recent decades, however, he has undergone a long overdue revival. There has been an explosion of English translations in recent years, with anthologies appearing from Paulist Press and St. Vladimir's Seminary Press. His Life of the Virgin Mary is out in a new edition from Yale University Press, and Harvard has brought out his Ambigua in two volumes, his work resolving contradictions and difficulties in the Fathers. Maximus inspires work in fields as diverse as ecological ethics, personal spirituality, and the theology of the laity. He also shows a way forward for those who long for a restoration of unity in the Church. Maximus had a deep appreciation for the office and authority of the Pope. He wrote that, quote, The Apostolic See has received from the incarnate Son of God himself universal and supreme dominion, authority, and the power of binding and loosing over all the holy churches of God. This is confirmed, he said, by all holy synods, according to the holy canons and definitions, which are in the whole world. For with it the Word, who is above the celestial powers, binds and looses in heaven as well. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope we've maximized your listening pleasure. If so, I ask you to please consider making a donation. We're entirely listener-funded. Just visit us at catholicculture.org and look for the button that says Donate. We're grateful for anything you can give. Remember, we pray for our benefactors every day. I thank you for listening. Dequorum solemnitate Gauden Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics, including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman. You might also enjoy Criteria, the Catholic film podcast, devoted to works of high artistic caliber and Catholic interest. And for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, listen to the Catholic Culture Podcast.